My name is Deepak Srivastava, and we're here at the 2019 annual meeting of the International Society for Stem Cell Research, where I currently serve as president, and I'm also president of the Gladstone Institutes in San Francisco. We're here today with uh, Dr. John Gurdon and Dr. Shinya Yamanaka, the co-recipients of the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, which they received for their fundamental discovery uh, that cells, even in the adult, maintain some plasticity where they can be coaxed into becoming uh, a, going back in time and actually becoming a much like a human embryonic stem cell, uh, and that these cells can, are no longer fixed uh, in their current state, which they'll tell us more about. Uh, Dr. Gurdon and Dr. Yamanaka, uh, your groundbreaking discoveries, uh, which actually spanned several decades, uh, really altered the face of stem cell biology and how we actually even think about uh, adult cells. Uh, maybe starting with uh, you, Dr. Gurdon, uh, how do you think uh, your discovery has uh, affected the scientific field? The scientific field, you mean of uh, adult cells or uh, yeah. anything? Maybe let's start with uh, the stem cell field. Yes. Well, the, the work that we did uh, all that time ago, <clears throat> and I'm talking of the 1950s, uh, certainly gave an unexpected result. And at that time, uh, there was no expectation that this kind of reprogramming that we saw through the eggs of amphibia would have any further consequences. And it's really entirely due to Shino Yamanaka's work that this whole field has expanded and received such enormous interest so it's taken that long time from the early work with frog eggs for, uh, for there to be some expected beneficial outcome of this from a therapeutic point of view. And maybe, maybe for our audience, you could uh, describe what was the initial discovery that your lab made in the 1950s? Yes, so this was that when you take cells from an amphibian embryo, uh, it is possible to transplant the nucleus of one of those cells into an enucleated egg of the frog and obtain uh, normal, uh, normal tadpoles from, from that experiment. But I should add that Briggs and King, two people from this country uh, working before we were, um, did an amazing experiment. They were the first to really show that you can transplant the nucleus of a living cell into an egg and get a normal embryo, even tadpole, from that. That was a, a major discovery, and they uh, established that. But as soon as they tried to do the same thing with a slightly more specialized cell, even a day later, than the first sort, it no longer gave that result. So that at the time, one would have drawn the conclusion uh, they did, and so would we if we had that result, that there must be some characteristic as cells differentiate that prevents the nucleus of one of those cells um, being made to go back uh, in development and become embryonic again. That's the how things were at that time. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, many decades went by and uh, the notion that the egg had some magic in it that could uh, reprogram a, the DNA of an adult cell uh, and that the phenomenon could occur. Uh, and uh, decades later it was shown in sheep that that could also occur and that resulted in cloning of Dolly the sheep. Uh, but it wasn't clear what those what was in the in the egg that could do that, and so I think the field uh, uh, couldn't purposefully do do what you had done and shown that it could be done. So, uh, Dr. Yamanaka, uh, your discovery uh, again five almost fifty years after uh, Dr. Gurdon's, uh, 
really change things. Maybe you could share with us uh, how, how that occurred and what that discovery was. So, uh, you know, I, I believe uh, when you published your important uh, work, it was uh, in 1962. That's correct. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the year I was born. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So, I. Uh, well, we didn't expect you to have read the paper as soon as you were born. <laughs> 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 So from what you did, we learned a lot. Uh, as uh, Deepak mentioned, we learned that egg should have some important factors, magic, magic, magical factors that can change the fate of adult cells back into the embryonic state. So from your experiment and from uh, the result of Dory, Dory the ship, we knew that X, X should have some factors, very important factors. So that was how I started my own research uh, almost 20 years ago. Or oh, in addition to X, from some other uh, uh, scientists, we learned that embryonic stem cells, they also have some specific factors that can reprogram adult cells back into the embryonic state. Uh, but we just didn't know how many factors are required. Uh, but we knew uh, there must be factors. <laughs> so we started uh, searching for those factors. And in 2006, we were able to uh, find four factors. Uh, that together, actually, they can convert adult skin cells back into the embryonic state. So those four factors are like magical factors. Uh, thanks to you, we, we were able to identify. Yes, you, you identified the factors. That was a, a key discovery, of course. Mm. 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 Well, what we identified is a combination. Yes. We didn't uh, identify those four factors, just a combination of, combination of, yeah, yes. of, of, of the known four factors. Mm. And uh, those four factors can do something similar to what the egg is able to do but they're not actually the factors that are in the egg. Is that right? Do you see the potential for us ever really understanding mm -hmm. what is it, what does the egg have yes. that are those, in fact, magic factors? How, how might the field figure that out? I think if I may answer that one, it is true that the egg does not seem to operate by the famous Yamanaka factors. When you test them, they have only a small effect on top of what the egg does. The egg has a lot of other things that are critical. Some of those we know what they are, others we don't. But uh, it's, I think we could say that the main thing that the egg does is not to supply Yamanaka factors. <laughs> it, 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 uh, they mostly, if you overexpress those factors, it doesn't make very much difference. So the egg seems to have a way of changing the chromatin structure of a somatic nucleus to an extraordinary extent, which uh, prepares the ground for all the other factors which come, on, come into action during development. At least that is how we see it. Yeah, and similarly, the Yamanaka factors, I've, as they've been come to know, be known, um, also uh, seem to wipe the epigenetic slate clean so that uh, even an adult cell is now sort of reset. Um, so it's remarkable that the end result from both uh, strategies is very similar. Uh, I think it, someday it would be fascinating to be able to know what those uh, resetting factors are uh, within the egg. Yes. Uh, but it's technically likely challenging um, it because it's such a small amount of material. Quite difficult. We, some of them we do know. Uh, but uh, and they're mostly chromatin modifying factors, uh, which re, re make change the the structure of the 
interface nucleus quite a lot. But as you say, there are many others, and we don't yet know what they are. It'd be very interesting to, to discover that. So those four factors can change the fate of other cells back into the embryonic state, but it's very slow. <laughs> it takes uh, at least two or three weeks, yes. whereas X can do the same job within like, one day. Yes. So the speed is yes. Yes. Uh, completely different. I think that's a very good point. Yeah, and the, um, of course, the eggs actually work at a very different temperature. So mm. as you say, within a day, mm -hmm. they've done what they need to do. But that's at uh, 17 degrees centigrade. And this is four times slower than mammalian cells work out. So oh, in a way, there's also that, mm -hmm. that difference. Um, yes. Um. And, and uh, Shinya, why do you think that uh, for the type of reprogramming you've described from a adult cell all the way back to a stem cell, or as many others have described from one adult cell type directly to another, mm -hmm. which also is possible to a number of different cell types, mm -hmm. in each case it appears that there is a combination mm. of factors that uh, are required to work together mm -hmm. to induce those changes. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is the basis of that? Oh, it's a good question. Uh, the exception is myOD. Yeah, uh, in the case of myOD, just one factor can convert fibroblasts <laughs> to uh, uh, muscle. Uh, but other than that, uh, we do need multiple factors. And actually, I don't know why. <laughs> Well, uh, we know that our cells are much more flexible than we anticipated, but it's not too, it's not too flexible. <laughs> so probably that's why we need more than one factor to convert one cell type to other. Otherwise, uh, they may change all the time, spontaneously. Which wouldn't be a good thing, and maybe cancer. Oh, yeah. Cancer is often yes. uh, mm -hmm. a condition where cells reprogram exactly. into bad cells exactly. that we don't want. Yeah. And so it's probably good to have uh, some mechanisms that yeah. make that some less likely. Barrier. Some barrier. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So speaking of barriers, um, even with the current cellular reprogramming approaches that many take, uh, there still are some barriers. Uh, maybe we, it might be good to talk about that for a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see as the barriers to the field that still need to be overcome? If I may offer an answer, um, it impresses me, as it always has, that as cells uh, become more differentiated, older, they become increasingly resistant to the reprogramming, so that uh, with the nuclear transfer work, by the time you get to a completely adult donor cell, the success of completely reprogramming it is really very low. Mm. Uh, it, it, if you take a specialized cell, the nucleus will undergo the first steps of being reprogrammed quite well. But the proportion of those cells that do that gradually gets less as you start with the more differentiated, more mature cells. And I think that's a really interesting question of what it is in that as cell differentiation proceeds, makes the resistance to reprogramming increasingly strong. Perhaps that's not so surprising because humans live for 80 years or more and most of our cells don't change. They're remarkably stable. I find that one of the most interesting aspects of this whole field now is what it is that stabilizes cell differentiation pathways. So they mostly don't change, fortunately. Yeah, that's right. So the cells are in a very stable state. And in fact, before your discoveries, people thought that that could never change. Yes, and, that uh, seemed to be I the view. Both the work from both of your laboratories have shown that it, it can change, but there's a lot of resistance. That's right. That's appropriate resistance yes, to change. Yes, yes. Uh, so perhaps to overcome some of the barriers, one has to find out what are those barriers and That's overcome right. them. That's uh, right. Absolutely right. And, and in fact, uh, while it was uh, uh, 
became relatively routine to uh, reprogram the nucleus from mice, not just tadpoles, but mice and sheep and uh, cows and dogs. Um, reprogramming the human nucleus actually turned out to be very different and with much more barriers. Uh, can yes. you comment on that? Uh, yes, it is true that the species you use uh, makes a big difference to the success rate. And um, it's uh, true that uh, I think it was, well, humans are difficult. You have to, all sorts of details have to be changed in order to get that to work. And I think there are still some species of mammals where you, it doesn't work. Uh, I forget, the, there was a time when rabbits and rats were like that, but maybe technology improves all the time and little details make a considerable difference. So there is this great attention to the tiny details of what is done in the procedure that makes it work uh, uh, better with the more resistant kinds of cells. Um, but, that, that's but it's always for, very striking. Uh, there was a lot of uh, ethical concerns and fear about the potential for human cloning, uh, particularly after Dolly the sheep was cloned. Uh, and it turned out that uh, those did not come to to fully face the scientific community because it didn't it has not been possible uh, to clone humans, which which may be a, a good thing. Uh, but for whatever reason, in the human species, it's not been the same as other animals. I think there hasn't been the incentive to really try with humans, and it would be difficult to do that because of the ethical constraints, and you can't do thousands of experiments with humans, so that's uh, uh, an important point. Um, and uh, when we, you mentioned Dolly the sheep, the famous Dolly the sheep, I, I, I realize that was an important step. Uh, the fact is that the success rate with Dolly the sheep was actually very small. In the first case, they, I think it was a couple of hundred experiments were done and one produced Dolly the sheep. Uh, and um, they used to say to me, why didn't you give names to your cloned frogs? Because they got, Dolly had a name and the short answer was we had too many. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't have thought of a couple of hundred names that were diagnostic. So it illustrates the considerable resistance that there is. Even, even in that species? That's yes, right. yes, because uh, methods always improve and people can do this much better than they could before, but it's the tiny details that seem to make such a difference. Yeah. So while the ethical concerns around human cloning did not uh, really come to, uh, to pass because of the difficulty in cloning humans, uh, around that same time, we, the field was able to grow human embryonic stem cells in a dish for the first time. Uh, but those uh, cells were derived from five-day-old human embryos, which itself created a big ethical debate around uh, the need for destruction of uh, human embryos, even though they were only five days old. Um, and uh, there were uh, bans on research in that space. And uh, Shinya, your discovery of induced pluripotent stem cells uh, largely obviated that ethical debate uh, because of the ability to create similar cells, not identical, but similar cells uh, using uh, your factors. Uh, could you comment on um, how you viewed that uh, period and that uh, ethical debate and your contribution to it? Yes, uh, actually that was one of the uh, strongest motivations why I started our research. Uh, in 1998, human ESLs uh, were ava became available. Or oh, there was a paper in Science uh, from Wisconsin, and I was uh, very very excited about the potential of human ESLs. We may be able to help millions of people suffering from intractable diseases, but only one uh, very high hurdle was the usage is the usage of human embryos. So I, I thought. Uh, from what I learned from John and uh, 
uh, other scientists, there must be a way to overcome that ethical hurdle. So that was why uh, I started uh, our IPSO work. So in 2007, when we became able to generate human IPS cells, we, we thought, wow, we could now overcome this ethical issue. But within a month or two, I realized we started a new ethical issue uh, by having IPS cells. Uh, because, well, uh, now we can avoid the usage of human embryos, but uh, by using IPSO technologies, at least in theory, we can make egg and sperm from our skin or from our blood uh, by going through IPS cell generation. Uh, in mouse, it's been already, uh, uh, the technology is already available. In human, not yet, but uh, at least in theory, we could do that. So that's that's dilemma. <laughs> Try to uh, overcome one ethical issue, but you know, ended up starting a new ethical issue. So it's very uh, very important <laughs> to uh, uh, think about ethics all the time. Yeah. Any other, you know, uh, new technologies, including like CRISPR, it can be a very good thing, but it may cause some ethical uh, problem. So we, we have to be very sensitive and we have to be very uh, transparent. You mentioned the CRISPR technology and uh, I think many think that uh, your IPS discovery and the CRISPR efficiency of gene editing are two of the major uh, discoveries of the last uh, 20 years uh, that are allowing us to understand human disease at a different level. Uh, you run a, a laboratory at the Gladstone Institutes uh, now, and uh, Jennifer Doudna has a laboratory there also who discovered CRISPR. Uh, tell us about how you, you what, what are the things you're most excited about now uh, in your own laboratory mm -hmm. uh, is the next discoveries? Mm -hmm. So, uh, CRISPR technology has uh, tremendous uh, impacts uh, on many, many uh, areas. Uh, it is a very nice tool in basic research. We can uh, delete any gene. We can change the expression pattern of any gene uh, very quickly. Uh, before CRISPR, we had to uh, knock out one gene by homologous recombination in ear cells. Uh, usually, it takes at least one year to uh, uh, modify one gene, <laughs> at least one year. It could take two or three years. But now, uh, thanks to CRISPR technology, uh, it takes only a day or two <laughs> to modify any, any gene of your interest. So it's, it's been just amazing. <laughs> uh, so we have been uh, utilizing CRISPR technology in iPS cells to uh, modify uh, many, many genes. And from iPS cells, we can generate any types of cells, like brain cells and heart cells. So the combination of the two uh, is, is very powerful in understanding uh, gene function in human and uh, other animal or models. So I really appreciate uh, Jennifer's discovery. And also, uh, uh, for cell transplantation, we have to overcome uh, immune rejection. So uh, in that aspect, CRISPR is very useful as well because we can modify our like, MHC uh, expression uh, very quickly by uh, using gene editing technology with CRISPR. So that's what we have been working on. Shinya, you mentioned the immune rejection. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you made, first made your discovery, people talked a lot about personalized mm -hmm. medicine because maybe we could uh, make mm -hmm. our own iPS mm -hmm. cells for transplantation back into us and our bodies would not reject those. Uh, that turned out to be somewhat impractical because of the cost mm -hmm. of developing each line and getting them approved. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, I know you have been working to get an, what we call an off-the-shelf product that uh, would be ready to use in everybody. And so when you described uh, the uh, MHC uh, editing, uh, maybe if you could explain that a little bit uh, more in terms of uh, what is the ultimate goal there? So as you uh, said, autologous iPS cells, autologous transplantation is uh, ideal. But from a practical point of view, it's too expensive. Uh, at, at least for the time being, it's too expensive and it takes at least uh, several months to prepare cells. And many patients would die, could not wait for many months. So uh, in order to overcome those practical issues, we have been working on iPS cell stocks. Uh, we generate iPS cells from HLA or MHC, homozygous donors. Uh, they are like uh, type O, O type blood donors. Uh, one HLA homo homozygous donors can provide cells to many, many patients without a huge amount of immune uh, rejection. So, or, for example, in, in Japan, uh, we are less diverse compared to many other uh, uh, countries. Just one HLA homozygous donor, uh, one iPS cell line from single donor can cover uh, almost 20%, more pre precisely 17% of all the Japanese population, just one donor. And we have generated iPS cells from four donors, HLA homozygous donors. Those four lines alone can cover 40% of all the Japanese population. So that's what we have been working on. So it's very good, four lines, uh, 40%. But how about the remaining 60%? It's more difficult. It's a lot of work. So uh, as an alternative approach, we are now working on uh, genome editing technology to, to, uh, to edit our MHC in order to lower uh, immune rejection. So that's our uh, backup strategy. And, and following on that one more step, uh, as we get all of that uh, figured out, uh, what are the uh, uh, clinical areas that uh, both of you think would be most uh, uh, amenable or may benefit earliest uh, from these types of therapies? Or shall I volunteer? And, um, I've been very enthusiastic about the attempts to uh, replace the retinal pigmented epithelium of the eye, and there are groups uh, in England and Japan and elsewhere who've been doing that. And now that looks particularly hopeful to me for the, for the following reason, that it's one particular cell type, the retinal pigmented epithelium, and if you think of trying to do something similar for the nervous system brain, you would need many cell types. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that makes the retinal replacement therapy particularly hopeful is the small number of cells needed. Mm -hmm. So like 50,000 cells would probably be very valuable. But if you try to replace a heart, you'd need billions of cells. So those are two reasons why I personally think there's enormously good prospect of using cell replacement for the eye, one cell type and small cell numbers. And this, uh, I would hope this would, before too long, be available to patients. At the moment it's not. And it's, uh, I think that's a great pity because it needs, um, all the regulations have to be satisfied and tests done. But that will be my view, that that is one of the most hopeful directions. Yeah, clinical trials are going on in the yeah. UK, in Japan, in the US, uh, using either IPS or ES cells. So it's, it's very promising. Mm. Uh, and also, uh, 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 one clinical trial for Parkinson disease has uh, also started in, in Japan. Uh, by Jun Takahashi, and uh, hopefully in, in the very near future, uh, uh, 
clinical trials will take place in other countries, including US and UK for Parkinson. Parkinson's. Yeah, this is. So it's also very promising. Uh, many, many scientists are working on many other target disease, including like type 1 diabetes, heart failure, although we would need many, many cells, uh, and also cancer, immunotherapy. It's, I think it's very promising. Right, so the ability to use iPS cells and gene editing to manipulate immune yes. cells yes. to find and kill cancer cells uh -huh. um, holds a lot of promise yes. as well. One of the problem of those innovative therapies uh, is the cost. Many of them are too expensive. For, for example, CAR T therapy against some uh, blood cancers, leukemia, uh, they are very effective, but they're very, very expensive. It's autologous, uh, CAR T. Uh, so we are now trying to perform CAR T uh, by using iPS cells. It's not autologous, uh, off the shelf iPS cells. Uh, so that we can lower the cost significantly. So that's, that's another activity we have been. Yeah, so then maybe that's an act, area that's a little bit less obvious mm -hmm. to most, but uh, the concept of using this chimeric antigen receptor mm -hmm. uh, modification for T cells, where they're uh, edited and changed mm -hmm. and then uh, utilized to go uh, function within your own body as immune cell to target many different diseases, I think, has potential and um, that is an area that really combines can combine IPS technology gene editing technology the immunology field mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, I think it's likely that uh, in the coming years the IPS technology will be used for many things that we haven't even conceived of mm -hmm. as yet uh, like like that area so I would say uh, you mentioned that IPS cells and gene editing uh, have really uh, changed the field of bioscience. But I would say uh, the most important progress we saw in the last 10 or 20 years was, uh, was, a rapid, was the rapid progress of sequencing. We can now sequence our entire genome in one day. So that technology is essential for iPS cells and also for uh, genome editing because we need to check the uh, uh, integrity of our genome after genome editing or after iPS cell reprogramming so that those cells are safe. So our, I, I, I would say three technologies. Yeah, next generation sequencing, uh, reprogramming, and uh, genome editing. Those, that combination is extremely powerful. Can I ask a question, uh -huh. Shinya? The, um, uh, the hope of using people's own cells mm -hmm. for cell replacement. I understand the, um, the excessive cost of that mm -hmm. is because of the regulations that apply to growing cells outside the mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. All the reagents have to be tested exhaustively. Is that the main reason why the cost would be so bad? That, that's one reason, yes, yes, that's one reason. And, uh, at the moment, we need to test each line. Yes. And uh, that part is very expensive. I see, yeah. So our regulation is one important issue. But we, we, have not, we haven't given up on right. autologous yeah. transplantation. So we mm -hmm. call uh, autologous iPS cells my iPS cells. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that within five years, we can reduce the cost and the time yeah. required so that we can provide iPS cells for each individual patient. Uh, the cost, right now it's too expensive. <laughs> yes, but, so the cost uh -huh. is the, the cost of testing uh -huh. cells or the cost of the reagents needed or? Uh, reagent, we have to use special reagent. And those are expensive. But we have to uh, uh, use a special room GMP facility. Yes. That's probably uh, the most ex expensive uh, part. Uh, yes, uh, we have to maintain a huge facility. Yes. And we have to hire many people to maintain yes. one facility. Yes. So uh, if we can have uh, like uh, this size of 
machine, <laughs> closed system, yeah. uh, where we can make autologous IPSOs without a huge GMP facility, yes. uh, we can reduce the cost tremendously. And that's what... Yeah. And, and it's highly likely that yeah. will happen in a matter yeah. of time. Yeah. The yes. technology uh -huh. will continue yes. to advance. Uh -huh. Now, we've talked so far mostly about uh, the use of these cells for cell transplantation. But in, particularly as you raise the issue of gene sequencing being so much cheaper now, it's conceivable in the coming uh, five to ten years that everybody will have the, know their own genetic variants mm -hmm. that might be contributing to disease. Um, how, maybe if you could comment on how you envision mm -hmm. the merging of that knowledge mm -hmm. with iPS cells and gene editing mm -hmm. uh, to find new therapies. How do you envision that evolving? Well, uh, it's a very good point. Uh, in addition to cell therapy, uh, one important application of iPS cells is drug discovery, drug development. Uh, especially uh, more personalized usage of drug. Uh, at the moment, we uh, provide one single uh, drug to many, many patients. Uh, for some patients, it's very effective. Uh, for many other patients, it's not effective at all. For some patients, it gives some side effects. So at the moment, there's uh, no way to predict which patients will be effective, uh, which patients will show side effect. But we are hoping by uh, utilizing iPSL technologies and sequencing technologies, we will become able to predict make such a prediction. So I, I think that's the future of medicine, yeah. personalized medicine or precision medicine. Good, good. Um, I want to get a little bit personal now, mm -hmm. if that's OK. Uh, each, each of you, I know, have had uh, uh, dealt with some difficulties uh, early in your career and, and overcame those to be here, sitting here today, uh, being interviewed about uh, being Nobel laureates. Um, so, uh, uh, John, maybe you could uh, describe that, uh, some of the things you've shared before about your early uh, career in, uh, in science uh, and some of the difficulties you had to overcome to make your discovery. Yes, yes. well, uh, but my own work was directed uh, to working, trying to do nuclear transfer with the South African frog, Xenopus. Uh, unlike the famous work of Briggs and King, who used the European frogs, Xenopus had the huge advantage, or has the huge advantage, of being able to produce eggs throughout the year, uh, because these frogs respond to mammalian hormone, and so can be made to produce eggs. The European frogs do not respond to mammalian hormone, so the amount of work you get done with Xenopus is about 10 times more than you could with the European frogs. But even then, there were some technical problems in trying to use Xenopus, and one of which was that the um, eggs are surrounded with an extremely elastic jelly, which means that if you make an extremely sharp needle, it won't go through the jelly. If you use the needle, it simply pushes the jelly right out the other end of the egg. And we had to find a way of dealing with that. And there were some other technical difficulties, but um, these, uh, perhaps by luck and so on, hard work, they were um, cured relatively fast. So that within a couple of years, the, these difficulties had been sufficiently overcome to actually progress uh, with the obvious experiments. So there's a, one example of the difficulties. <laughs> now, many young people, when they see accomplished uh, scientists, uh, they feel like they were always destined to be that. And uh, if they don't see that in themselves when they're their 20-year-old self, then they could never achieve that. What would you say to that? The, uh, the point being that if you uh, do you mean that uh, you have to put up with difficulties in order to... No, I guess what I'm getting at, you've shared a story before of your uh, 
early experience in achievement in science. Oh, yes, yes. Um, and I thought it might be useful for young uh, people to hear that because uh, it's often not obvious to them yes. that, uh, yes. that one can uh, take many paths to where they get. Yes, but it is true that I was, uh, at the age of 15, I was given one semester of science teaching and I came out in the bottom uh, position of 250 people. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely the, the, the worst of the whole lot. So the school said, well, one thing's absolutely clear that you're not a scientist. Because so, you didn't like science? Or? Uh, no, I liked science, but okay. I was told I was so bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so they put me on to learning ancient Greek and Latin for the rest of my school time, which has not been useful. Uh, and it took some considerable help from the family to enable me to uh, get back into be trying to become a scientist. So I, it's always, I'm always quoted as an example of someone who had no, uh, no natural ability or n nothing that showed up and had to struggle to get into the field that one felt one had some interest in and aptitude for. So uh, a sort of example of that yeah. kind. And I think it's useful for young people to know that uh, that struggle is normal and uh, they shouldn't let others define uh, what they can and cannot do. And uh, Shinya, you trained as an orthopedic surgeon first and uh, I know had some difficulty in even being able to identify a place that would be willing to train you to be a scientist. And even then you had, you faced some uh, challenges where science didn't work out the way you expected, uh, but you, you know, I, is it a, your career is a great example of turning lemons into lemonade. Uh, it, maybe you could share that, uh, that sort of uh, your path. Yes, uh, so I really wanted to become an orthopedic surgeon, but I found I was not talented as a surgeon, so I decided to become a scientist. And I, uh, as soon as I changed my career, I found science is my job. Because science is like uh, uh, writing anything on a white paper. I, I felt that way. Whereas being a, a surgeon is more, uh, uh, less freedom. <laughs> You have to do what uh, your uh, 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 mentor <laughs> told you or what was uh, described in textbook. Uh, so I found uh, less flexibility or freedom as in becoming a surgeon. So uh, to me, being a scientist is very uh, the way I should, I should go. But e even after I became a scientist, I had a hard time because uh, science is more, uh, uh, is science is unpredictable. <laughs> uh, you have to be very patient. Uh, if, when I was in clinics, I see I saw patients every day, so uh, almost every day we had some success. Some patients uh, got better. Or oh, there is some uh, joy day by day, but in science, uh, sometimes almost more than one year or two years, no success. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, just failure, failure, failure. Yes. So yeah. we have to be very uh, patient. But every five years, 10 years, <laughs> there is a success. Yes. So that's, uh, that's one difference between clinic, yes. clinician and mm. scientist. But I, I like science better. Uh, but when I started this IPSL project, I knew it should work because of your, because of your work. But I also thought it would be very, very difficult. It would take 20 years, 30 years, or even longer. That was my mindset. What I was doing was extremely difficult. But uh, at that time, I was not in uh, medical school. I was at, uh, at Nara Institute of Science and Technology. 
I had many opportunities to uh, interact with uh, other, other scientists, other than medical scientists, uh, including like, plant scientists. And they changed my mindset. Mm -hmm. When I uh, uh, talked about my own project, uh, trying to reprogram our cells back into the embry embryonic state, I told them this should be very, very difficult. But one plant scientist came to me after my talk and senior, uh, in plant, it's not so difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's actually very easy. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I couldn't understand. But in reality, in plant, cloning is very simple. All you need is just cut any part of one plant and yes. insert to uh, another plant. That's all you need for. Yes. And if when you cut uh, the, the branch of a plant, they form uh, callus. Callus is a kind of a, a totipotent cells. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, plant is full of pluripotent cells, totipotent cells. Mm -hmm. So that short conversation really changed my mm -hmm. mindset. Mm -hmm. After that, I thought maybe I'm wrong. Maybe what I'm trying to do is not so yes. difficult, not too difficult. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, the case. It, it didn't take 20 years. Mm -hmm. It took only like five or six years. So that kind of interaction with other uh, experts yeah. is really I important. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when, when you were uh, a postdoctoral fellow training at the Gladstone Institute in the 1990s, mm -hmm. I know you were, had set out to try to lower cholesterol levels, yeah. and you ended up creating uh, liver cancer yeah. instead. Um, how did that uh, unfortunate event uh, lead to your interest in uh, uh, stem for, cells? For some people, that may have been unfortunate. But for me, it was extremely fortunate. I really enjoyed that kind of unexpected result. And I think that's probably the biggest reason why I like science, uh, because that is that kind of unexpected result, which may uh, bring you to wonder, <laughs> to a breakthrough. Right? So it, it happened to me uh, multiple times, but I really like that kind of unexpected, totally unexpected result. We can enjoy that kind of unexpected result in laboratory, but in clinics, you, you cannot. <laughs> That's true. Can I ask Shinya a question? So when you started uh -huh. your famous experiments with the lead to the Yamanaka factors, mm -hmm. how long did that take from the time you started that work to when you got a result? Uh, actually, uh, less than five years. We, we started about less than five, five, five years. years. Yes, yes, really, yes, yes. Oh. yes. Interesting, yes. Now, um, I, uh, I had the great uh, privilege and honor to be present the week that both of you received your Nobel Prize in Stockholm. And uh, for me, it was an experience of a lifetime, but I can only imagine uh, what that experience must have been like for the two of you. And, and most people uh, will never get to experience that. But I thought it might be good to hear from, uh, from each of you, uh, what was that week like, and uh, how, how would you describe it to, to others? Well, certainly for me, it was a completely unforgettable experience. And uh, um, one's immensely grateful to the Swedish people for arranging such a, an amazing week, actually, of, of events. Um, and um, for me, I'm sure there will not, no, be no other occasion in life as, um, as impressive and uh, 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 so much appreciated uh, as that. Yes, it was uh, uh, probably the most exciting and unforgettable week in my life. So, and also uh, that trip became the last trip with my mother. <laughs> so I will not forget, yeah, in the rest of my life, yes. She passed away a few years ago, so, but she really enjoyed it, yes. Uh, and uh, I imagine uh, 
uh, being a Nobel laureate uh, likely changes your life in many ways, permanently. Yeah, well, I would think it. I've and been certainly. How, how did it change your life? Um, well, uh, you, you get an enormous number of requests to make presentations, give talks, and so on. So, this, um, I'm sure, even Greater Virginia, but it, it was you're inundated with requests to uh, make contributions to various things, and of course, you can't do all of them. So, that was the most noticeable change, I would say. Well, uh, to me, the biggest change in my life happened uh, in 2007 when we announced the generation of human iPS cells. That event really changed my life. Before that, I was uh, just one scientist uh, doing my own experiments. But after that, uh, my uh, life has really uh, changed. So I became uh, a leader of a uh, much big, bigger uh, team. So I, since then, I haven't been able to do any uh, experiments by myself. <laughs> I uh, really uh, miss it. So that, that was the biggest change. And the uh, 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 Nobel Prize was uh, the second biggest change uh, to me. So I was uh, kind of well prepared for, for that change. Mm -hmm. But uh, after Nobel Prize, uh, especially in Japan, uh, I couldn't uh, go to uh, many restaurants <laughs> because uh, many Japanese people uh, can recognize my face, so I have to behave very well, <laughs> that's, that's very tough. <laughs> so so uh, you run a second laboratory at the Gladstone Institutes in San Francisco. So when you're in San Francisco, uh, I assume that's OK. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very small. Uh, it's really my own, only one lab. Uh, in Kyoto, I don't have my lab anymore. I just uh, over oversee many other groups, so uh, the lab that Gladstone is my real scientific uh, experience. Yes, thank you. Thank you for giving me and that opportunity. It, it, you mentioned the, how the Nobel Prize changed your life in terms of the demands on you, uh, but it also gives you, likely gave you a platform mm -hmm. from which to try to shape uh, science and uh, the stem cell field and uh, things at a broader level that may, perhaps you would not have had had you not won the Nobel Prize. How have you leveraged uh, that opportunity? Um, well, when I gave a talk earlier at this meeting, I gave the example of how things have changed in the 67 years since I've been at the bench. <laughs> and um, some things are spectacular. As Shinya says, the technology has advanced immeasurably. Um, the publications are worse than they were, but bearable, and the worst of all are the regulations. And the example I was giving was when I, uh, for 60 years, I used to have a license to inject a needle under the skin of a frog. And suddenly, uh, about a year ago, they said, your license is, has to be renewed and you must reapply. So I had to fill out an enormous 40 pages of forms to explain what I wanted to do. Uh, and in due course, the organization said, you, you have failed. You, you have failed this exam. You, you will need to be trained again. Um, and this was just to inject a needle under the skin of a frog, which is probably more painless than doing so in, in humans. So this was uh, all due to regulations, none of which do any good at all for the animal. Animals are looked after very well, and uh, it would be nice if they would pay some small attention to this point that I'm making, that the regulations are completely out of line with the intention, which is to be uh, protective for animals. So I think that's one, uh, uh, whether it makes any difference, having a Nobel Prize, I don't know, probably not. Probably the administrators say, well, that's just, that's too bad. Yeah, yeah. 
And, and Shinya, with uh, your uh, stature in Japan, as you mentioned, being a household name and recognizable, also comes, uh, you've, I think you've had the opportunity to be a major uh, influencer uh, in Japan and around the world. How have you leveraged that? Uh, that is true, but to be honest, I feel uh, more responsible for many, many patients waiting for new therapies. So when we received the Nobel Prize, uh, it was a bit too early for clinical or usage, uh, especially uh, cell therapy. We are moving forward to clinical trial, but it's still uh, on the way. Uh, it, it, we still have to keep working for 10 years or 20 years. So I feel lots of pressure. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have to bring this technology to patients. So uh, that's how I, I, I feel after 2012. You know, like uh, our colleague, Dr. Honjo, received that same prize uh, last year. In his case, uh, his basic research uh, 20 years ago has already helped thousands or millions of patients uh, suffering from cancer. Uh, so I really, am, in a sense, envy him. <laughs> I, in our case, we haven't been able to help any patients. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I feel uh, very, very responsible. Yes. Yeah, well, I think uh, there's a sense of urgency you feel, the ISSCR feels, and uh, I think I'm certain that together we'll push uh, this to help people in a safe but effective manner in the coming years. And uh, these, uh, your discoveries uh, will lead to cures for so many human diseases for which right now there are absolutely no therapies. So thank you for your contributions. Yeah, I really hope so. I hope so. That, but there are many hurdles. Yes, so we have to overcome uh, one by one. Uh, Dr. Gurdon and Dr. Yamanaka, I want to thank you for your time and sharing your experiences with our audience today. Thank you very much. Thank you.